All right, if you have your Bibles, turn with me to Ecclesiastes chapter 2. Uh, this is our third week of study. Uh, we did an introduction two weeks ago, and last week we covered the first chapter. Uh, it's kind of, you know, you, you just kind of try to figure out where the break is. We can't cover uh, a whole chapter in every session. Uh, this one's going to actually break up into two sessions, uh, but we will have that going on. And again, next week's Body Life, uh, so Paul Walker will be preaching for us. Uh, he's our designated, we voted the other day, our designated Body Life man. Uh, so we, we praise the Lord for that. <laughs> All right, the vanity of pleasure. The vanity of pleasure. Uh, everybody get an outline? I put outlines back there. I had a request before church, and I had a request after church last week. And so whoever requested, you, uh, we, we aim to please, all right? Uh, some people like to uh, jot some notes down, and we'll do this. All right. Number one, the vanity of pleasure, the test of enjoyment. The test of enjoyment. And folks, there's nothing wrong with having a good time, okay? Uh, there's some folks that believe that when you get saved, God takes all your good times away. I've heard that, especially when I was younger, and uh, that is not true, not a true statement. Number two is the test of work. Work, work. We got to work, okay? God uh, put Adam and Eve in the garden and said, man, you got to work it. Uh, but again, we will be talking about that. And the number three, the test of success. And this is the one that trips a lot of people up, okay? Uh, folks, success can be a downfall. It really can. There's nothing wrong with being successful. There's nothing wrong with having money. Uh, that's not the issue. It's what you do with that money and the attitude that you have uh, with that success. And uh, sometimes that's not a good thing. You know, Solomon had begun well. Uh, his father was King David, who many thought was probably one of the best kings of Israel. As the years went by, Solomon made some bad choices and some serious mistakes in life. We talked about them last week, and uh, we said one of his weaknesses were women. All right, He married uh, people outside Israel, and uh, we know how all that uh, just kind of wrecked his life. Uh, he lost his vision of God uh, as he was distracted by things. As he prospered and became great among of the people, he forgot where he began and started taking things for granted. The saying, there's but one step from the sublime to the ridiculous, uh, held true uh, for Solomon. In they, that great laboratory of life, he experimented with one thing after another, but could not find peace or satisfaction in things. This is a classic example of how our society is today always looking for bigger, better, and things uh, that, that thrill and, and not taking into consideration uh, there is judgment also. We truly have lost our focus on the most important relationship we have on earth, and that is our relationship with God and with Jesus Christ. Let's look at more of Solomon's frustration in Ecclesiastes 2. I said in my heart, come now, I will test you with mirth, therefore enjoy pleasure. But surely this also was vanity. And the word vanity we spoke of last week, uh, how it's used 38 times in the book of Ecclesiastes. And he says in his heart, and a lot of times when you hear that phrase, that means people are pondering something. Okay, they've had time and they've had experience, they've had life. And they look back and they ponder things in their heart. And the three tests that we are uh, seeing uh, tonight, the first one is enjoyment. And folks, uh, you know, there's nothing wrong with a good laugh, all right? There's nothing wrong with having fun. But what tends to happen is sometimes people get where they have fun at other people's expense. And they don't consider others in any way. And it's just like, uh, you know, those who are, are down and out, those who are poor, all right, if, if we would in, 
and as a society, if, if somehow we could get the rich folks just to share some, okay, uh, because folks, everything that we get, and I'm not just saying rich people, but I'm, I'm just saying they have a lot of resources. And I know quite a few people do this, all right? But again, you know, to get where, you know, it's like we're all, they're always on TV, you know, they're always buying these extravagant gifts, you know, uh, they can't be satisfied with one car. Uh, I know a star, if I name the the guy you would know exactly who I'm talking about. He has over 40 kinds of Mercedes-Benz. 40 kinds. Now, what, folks, what do you do with 40 Mercedes? It, it's, it, you know, like I said, it, it deals with the ridiculous at times. And so he is just saying, even in all of this, all the things that I have, it still is empty. Because here's the deal about what you have, all right? When you have something, you, you normally want something to top that thing that you have. All right, like people that go to formal parties and formal things. I mean, they are going to be seen. They want to know the, the, the brand name of your dress. They want to know how much you know, your dress costs or, or your suit or whatever you have on. Okay, and folks, again, you know, I, I don't know. I've learned a long time ago that... I am not going to live my life to outdo somebody else. I just don't think we should do that. All right? And, and again, there are times, weddings and things like that, man, if you want to dress up, if you want to spend money on that, that's fine. But it's like Solomon was the richest man in the world. Solomon at one time was the wisest man in the world. And it was just almost like he was diving into everything, everything, as you will see down through here, trying to have pleasure uh, the word we use today just simply is fun, all right? I think there was a song called Girls Just Want to Have Fun. Well, I'd be careful about that if I were you, all right? Because sometimes this so-called fun can get you into a lot and lots of trouble. And I think that's where Solomon was. Solomon was getting to where just the mundane, the everyday of life wouldn't satisfy him, okay? He was looking for a bigger thrill. All right, verse 2, and I said, of laughter, madness, and of mirth, what does it accomplish? Verse 3, I, I searched in my heart how to gratify my flesh with wine. And again, folks, he is just speaking, again, in truth. He's speaking the things that he tried, all right? Just having fun, just laughter, all right? Uh, and, and this going on, and so it gets to where that doesn't satisfy. So now he turns to wine while guarding my heart with wisdom and how to lay hold uh, on, on folly till I might see uh, what is good for the sons of men to do under heaven all the days of my life. And again, when you start messing with wine and alcohol, all right, you to me are departing from wisdom. Because there, I mean, Proverbs tells us the dangers. And I understand, you know, there's a lot of people see that there's nothing wrong with having a glass of wine with a meal. And again, that, that's a personal preference. But there's three things I have a problem with that is. The first one is, it's against our covenant. Read your church covenant, okay, to abstain from all sorts of alcohol, all kinds of alcohol, all right? Number two is, where do you buy it at? People are watching what you buy and what you purchase. All right? I've used this example before, but I think it's a great one. And again, I don't know where the liquor stores are. I really don't. But I know there's a Shamrock down because I ride my motorcycle down that way uh, by Van Buren somewhere. And if you just have me going by there and you look in there and my truck's in front of the liquor store, what are you going to think? Well, I know exactly what you're going to think. All right, he's purchasing liquor. All right, and again, my wife could have told me, you know what, I have this uh, fruit cake. All right, and this fruit cake has this bit of wine or this stuff in it, and it, you know, it cooks out and it does all that. But what it does, it, it puts doubt in your mind. What is my preacher? And, and you might even say, maybe he's witnessing there. Okay, maybe he's witnessing to somebody. But the point is, 
you are going to a place to purchase that, even whether it's Walmart or wherever it is, okay? And the third thing is, I don't want to be a stumbling block for someone else, okay? And I understand personal convictions. I'm just simply saying, the, the, and, and the fourth thing is, here's the thing that scares me. A person never knows when they take their first drink if that will become a habit, okay, to where, you know, you got to have a drink and then you get another drink, all right? I, I, I know folks, and I have dealt with folks, that they work eight hours of the day, they come in, they drink till they go to bed, and they use that as a sedative. It helps them sleep. But folks, there's dangers in that. There's dangers in that. Hold your finger there and go with me to Proverbs 23. Just go back. It's not very far at all. Proverbs 23, verse 29. Proverbs 23, 29. Who has woe? Okay, woe is problems. Who has sorrow? We know what that is. Who has contentions? That's fights. Okay, that's arguments. Who has complaints? Who has wounds without cause? All right? And it just cracks me up. And, and again, uh, you know, I've seen all this in action in my life, in school, in college. I saw all these things. And to wake up the next day and you have a bruise and you have no idea where you got that bruise. Okay? You don't know. When you got home, you don't know. And, and I had even seen this at the workplace uh, where I worked at a secular job uh, where, where I was in college. The guys there would work two weeks. We got paid every two weeks. And that after we got that Friday check, they would go out Friday night and, and, and just spend their money on alcohol and go to places and bars, and then they'd do it again on Saturday. They'd come in, and they couldn't remember half of what they did, and they were flat broke. They had no money. And I'm just thinking, you know, I, I was 18, 17 and 18 years old, and even at that, I thought, man, I worked hard for my money. I am not spending it in two nights. A two-week check gone in two nights. And this is what it's saying. Who has redness of eyes? Uh, and, and you can see that in their physical being. Who, uh, those who linger long at the wine. And I understand Ephesians, all right, do it in moderation, okay? And again, I think much of that was uh, medicine in the days, all right? They didn't have pharmaceutical places like that uh, then. And it says, those who go in search of mixed wine, do not look on the wine when it is red, when it sparkles in the cup, when it swirls around smoothly. And I've heard this even said several times. Well, Jesus drank wine. Well, do you know that he drank it? Were you there? <laughs> I mean, he could have. All right, I'm not saying he hasn't. All right, but I, I, just, I just really see the dangers. And when I say wine, I want to just preface it with alcohol. Okay, alcohol. It says, and at, the, and at last it bites like a serpent and stings like a viper. All right, here is the alcoholic that his whole life is consuming alcohol. We're talking young families, okay, where the kids maybe go short on milk or grow on diapers because dad got on a drunken stupor and, and spent all their money. These are the things that can happen. Your eyes will see strange things, and your heart will utter perverse things. I'll tell you the other thing. A lot of times it makes them sick. They buy all this, and then they spend half of their night in the bathroom throwing up. I'm like, are you kidding me? And that's what they call fun? That's what the world calls fun. All right, you cannot watch a sporting event without seeing a beer commercial. You just can't. Folks, it's just we are inundated in America with that. And while we're at it, <laughs> the med the medical marijuana, I understand in some cases, all right, if someone's dying of cancer and that is the only way they can find relief, then I understand that. If it is, but I am telling you, uh, was it, I was thinking Thursday or Friday night, all right, in Arkansas, $17 billion in taxes since it started. And that's how they justify it. It's like the college lottery, the same thing. Well, why don't I just go ahead and get all this in here right now, okay? All right, not just the lottery. How about the casinos? 
just west here. You can get on 540 and just head to the casinos. Okay? How many people have spent their paychecks gambling when they're kids? And, and folks, that's what I'm saying. This is the party scene that people say, we're having a great time. We're having a great time. And, and folks, it, it's detrimental to family values. It really is. Verse 34, yes, you will be like the one who lies down in the midst of the sea, probably a not, not a smart thing to do, or like one who lies at the top of the mass, saying, they have struck me, but I was not hurt. Folks, I, I tell you, I don't even know if I told this story here, but it is a true story. I was reading an article years ago where a guy witnessed a guy getting drunk on a yacht, and he got at the front of the deal and was out there, and it was storming, and he said, if you are God, you just strike me dead right here, and it happened. I read that in an article. The guy said the guy was struck by lightning. Be careful who you tempt, folks. Be ter- careful what you say. And that's the other thing about drunks. They just, they're so obnoxious. They are obnoxious. I just, I'm just like, would you just be quiet for a minute? All right. They have struck me, but I was not hurt. They have beaten me, and I did not feel it. When shall I wake? that I may seek another drink. And folks, it's like all drugs. The things with drugs that bothers me the most, you could start with medical or whatever, and marijuana, you can go online, I am told, and not have a card and get marijuana. Okay? But again, that's what they call a recreational drug. A lot of times, it leads to harder things. Okay? You have to have bigger thrills. You have to have higher highs. All right, and, and that's what these verses are speaking of. Now, turn to 1 Corinthians 8, all right? 1 Corinthians 8. I want to show you what I meant by stumbling block. 1 Corinthians 8, verse 9. 1 Corinthians 8, 9. But beware lest somehow this liberty of yours become a stumbling block to those who are weak. And here's what I hear. It's my life. I can do what I want. Okay? All right? It's none of your business, okay, what I do. If I want to do this, I can do that. And I understand that. You have the freedom to do that. But, folks, you're also, as a Christian, representing Jesus Christ. Okay? And you were bought with a price, and the price was the blood of Jesus Christ. And, folks, we need to reflect Jesus Christ, not the world's values. The world's values. Uh, And the weak folks are either new Christians or the lost, okay? New Christians are the lost. For if anyone sees you who have, who have knowledge uh, eating in an idol's temple, uh, will not the conscience of him who is weak be uh, emboldened to eat those things offered to idols? And what he's saying is, and he was just using a modern day, exact, not modern day, but in the day the, this scripture was written, okay? You know, you know, eating meat. And again, you know, Clean and unclean is not the issue, all right? That's not what he's talking about. He's just talking about if it makes a brother of my stumble, then I I shouldn't do that. I I shouldn't do that. Verse 11, And because of your knowledge shall the weak brother also perish for whom Christ died, all right? I don't want to be an excuse for someone else to backslide. Okay, Maybe, maybe they have a problem that I don't have. Maybe that's a weakness in their area. Okay, and folks, I'll say this, any addiction, it's tough. It's tough, addiction. Because even like with me, I know my addiction is food. There is no doubt in my mind. All right, and what I'll do, I'll say, well, I'm just eating, you know, it's my body, I can look like I want to do all I want. Well, you know what my wife says? You know, I'd like you to live to be 80. If you keep eating these chicken fried steaks and gravy and bread, it's not going to, and cake, Cinnamon rolls, you're not going to live to be 80. So I, I, I mean, I understand their thinking, but when I smell cinnamon rolls, there's something in my DNA that just goes, thank you, God, thank you. And we laugh at that, and I'm not getting on you for laughing because I laugh at myself at times. All right, I'll do good, I'll do good, I'll do good, and then I'll, I fell off the wagon Saturday. I mean, I went to the catfish hole and got a bellyache when I got home. Fried, 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 fried. But here's the thing. 
It's no different than an alcoholic. It's no different than someone who does drugs. It's just a different vice. All right, so don't start getting on to people. We all have vices, but you have to understand you don't want that to influence other people around you. But when you thus sin against the brethren and wound their weak conscience, you sin against Christ. Therefore, if food makes my brother stumble, I will never eat meat again. All right, this is Paul talking. And folks, Paul was one of the strongest Christians, one of the most disciplined Christians. And he was literally saying, if this keeps someone from being saved or finding Christ, I'm not going to do it. I'm just going to quit. I'm going to quit. All right? And he says, lest I make my brother stumble. So, in the first part here, he was looking at laughter and life and fun, all right, and wine and trying, you know, to... to, to Get that good feeling. And uh, he says it's vanity, vanity, it's all vanity. Look at verse 4. Not only the test of enjoyment, but the test of work. I made my works great. I built myself houses and planted in my vineyards. If you'll read in 1 Kings, I, don't, I didn't write down the deal, but I was reading his house. It took 13 years to build his house. <laughs> okay, 13, how, I mean, how... How can it take that long? It simply means he built it for show. Okay? And folks, this is the world thing. Okay, what do you drive? Where do you live? What do you got on? How, how, what carrot is that diamond? That's the world, folks. Solomon had it all. Planted myself vineyards. I made myself gardens and orchards. I planted all kinds of fruit trees in them. I made myself water pools. And that can be taken two ways, okay? One is a water system, which is what I believe because he's talking about the vegetation and that goes on down there. But even one writer that I read earlier in the week said, you know, he could have had one of the first swimming pools. All right, can you imagine uh, back then? I know people swam because of bodies of water, but I'm pretty sure they didn't have pools per se like we have. Which uh, water and growing trees in the grove. I acquired male and female servants and had servants born in my house. Generations of servants. Her mother was my cook. Her dad worked in my fields and had that. I mean, all his life. Matter of fact, you look at Solomon and you would think he was, the phrase that we say he was born with a golden spoon in his mouth. All right? David was his daddy. All right, and he, he, he got a lot of this uh, because of David. And yes, I had great possessions of herds and flocks than all who were in Jerusalem before me. And I also gathered for myself silver and gold and special treasure of kings and providences. So what did he think? He thought, well, I've got a lot of money, but I might as well get some more. You never know. You think they had recessions back then? I have no idea about that. But this, this, the same theory is true. How much money is enough? How much money? One of the billionaires said just a billion more. Okay, these, these folks that, that live for money. And folks, it's not wrong to work hard. Okay, it's not wrong to save money. There's nothing wrong with that. But where, uh, again, you're just trying to accumulate all this wealth all right, and all you are thinking about is yourself and fun and pleasures, uh, then there is something uh, wrong with that. I acquired male and female singers and delights the son of men and music instruments of all kinds. And we know that Solomon built the temple. He also did good things. I know it just seems like I'm kind of dogging him tonight, but I'm just telling you he did good things. First Kings 5, look at this. I want you to see this, 1 Kings 5, because I learned something as I was studying this week that I, I did not know. 1 Kings 5, verse 1. Now Hiram, king of Tyre, sent his servants to Solomon, because he heard that he had anointed him in king in place of his father. For Hiram uh, always loved David. Then Solomon sent to Hiram, saying, You know how my father David could not build a house for the name of the Lord his God because of the wars which he fought against him on every side until the Lord uh, put his foes under the soles of his feet. And he was basically saying he shed too much blood. Okay, we know uh, it could be talking about David, uh, Uriah, 
and Bathsheba. Verse 4, but now the, the Lord my God has given me rest on every side. There's neither adversary nor evil occurrence. And behold, I propose to build a house for the name of the Lord my God. As the Lord spoke to my father David, saying, Your son, whom I will set on your throne in your place, he shall build the house uh, for my name. And folks, Solomon did that. He did a good thing uh, in that. He used his wealth for good. Now therefore command that they cut down cedars from, from Lebanon, and my servants will be with your servants, and I will pay you wages for your servants according to whatever you say. For you know that there is none among us who has skill to cut timber like the Sidonians. So, and again, you know, we know uh, the temple and all the, the end in, in furnishings. And uh, folks, it was incredible. It was an incredible piece of building. So it was when Hiram heard the words of Solomon that he rejoiced greatly and said, Blessed be the Lord this day, for he has given David a wise son over this great people. And then in verse 13, if you have your Bible, I just realized I wrote that down late today. Then King Solomon raised up a labor force out of all of Israel. And this is what I learned. The labor force was 30,000 men. Can you imagine? Paul Walker, you've, you've had a few crews or two. Can you imagine 30,000 men building your house and building the temple and all of that, all right? So, and, and again, folks, there's nothing wrong with working. Work is a good thing. But sometimes workaholics miss out on the plans of God because all they know is work, okay? And, and again, I believe in work. I, th I think the generation below us, a good eight hours of sweat, will put them in bed for two days, all right? They don't know what it's like to work by the sweat of your brow. And I did learn that from my father. I know it's still Father's Day. My dad was one of the hardest workers. I've, I mean, we built sheds. We built his, his house. And I say we. He just told me how to do it. I learned to shingle from my dad. All right? Things that I didn't want to do. I learned to dig ditches from my dad, all right, for... for plumbing and things like that. We, me and him literally one summer built their, their house. You know, and we, we had subs, but I'm just saying not very many. Dad did a lot of work. So working is good. But again, you can even overdo work where you don't even enjoy life. It's just work, work, work. I mean, these folks that work you know, 50, 60, and 70 hours, these people that, and it's not wrong to get overtime. Okay, but to where it's just to the point that all you do is work is not good on family life either. Mark chapter 8. Mark chapter 8. Go with me to Mark 8. Mark chapter 8. Verse 34. Mark eight thirty-four. And when he had called the people to himself with his disciples also, he said to them, Whoever desires to come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. Now, I understand Solomon is in the Old Testament and Jesus is in the New Testament. Folks, if you want to be, be a disciple of Christ, you know, it's, all, it's not about you know, glory and fame. and It's not on how big a church are you building or you know, you've written arenas, you know, uh, what's, you know, and, and I've read some things on, you know, the mega churches and, you know, their assets and the pastors and all that stuff. And, and folks, sometimes I truly believe they go over the line in these things, all right? Uh, the extravagant, you know, and, and things like that is, is just not what Jesus is talking about here. And it's, and, and don't take me wrong, you know, we're, I'm not saying we should be paupers or we should be poor. I don't believe that either. But folks, God needs to be first in our life. That's the key there. God needs to be first in our life. Verse 35, for whoever desires to save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake and the gospel will save it. Folks, I've, I've thought about this because youth used to ask, you know, talk to me about, well, what about these drug dealers that have all these money? What about these, you know, they'll look at the, the 
Playboy mansions and they'll look at things like this and they're, you know, millionaires and billionaires. And folks, what I always tell them, folks, there's a payday someday, all right? Every one of those multi-billionaires, folks, they're going to stand before God. They're going to give their account of life to God. And, and really, in a lot of cases, the more money you have, the more miserable some people are. I'm not saying they all are. I'm not. But I'm simply saying, uh, you know, if they sell their souls for the almighty dollar, uh, folks, uh, you know, they're, they're, they're the ones who are going to suffer uh, in the second life. Verse 36, for what will a profit a man if he gains the whole world and loses his soul? So what if I am considered the richest man in the world? Folks, if I don't have Jesus, I lose. I lose. Or what will a man give in exchange for his soul? Folks, there's a lot of folks that have exchanged money for their soul, that exchanged things for the soul. And, and again, all through here, Solomon is saying, man, I've tried this. I've tried work, I've tried gathering, I've tried fun, I've tried pleasure. It's vanity, vanity, and it's all vanity. Matthew 6. Go with me to Matthew 6. Matthew 6, verse 24. Matthew 6, 24. Hope I didn't mess you up, Tony. I went in the wrong order there, buddy. <laughs> Sorry about that. Matthew 6, 24. No one can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will be loyal to one and despise the other. Folks, we have to decide who's, who we're going to serve. All right, we're going to serve the God of this Bible, or are we going to serve the God of this world? The God of this world. You cannot serve God in mammon. You could put money in there. You could put things in there. We have to choose who we're going to serve. And I don't know about you, but I'm Joshua. I'm the Joshua guy. As for me and my house... We're going to serve the Lord. We're going to serve the Lord. And folks, if you compare your life, I promise you I've been into several third world countries. We are rich. We are rich. All right? We are blessed. All right? We can go home, open our refrigerator, and open our cabinets, and we could eat for three months out of one of the two or both of them. All right? Where there are a lot of people that when they get up in the morning, they're just looking for something to eat. So we see the test of enjoyment, the test of work, and the last one is the test of success. Look at verse 9, and we finish this up. So I became great and excelled more than all uh, who were before me in Jerusalem. Okay, success, all right? And do you know what successful, it means to successful people? You know what it, you know what it turns into? It turns into a competition, okay? I got more money than you got. I got more cars than you got. I've got more, and you just fill in the blanks, furs, what, whatever. All right, it becomes a competition uh, to the rich. Uh, also, my wisdom remained with me. And, and again, I, I see some, not just vainness there, all right, but thinking of all that he listed here, I'm, I'm thinking he's losing a little of that wisdom. And folks, I'm telling you, sin dulls our wisdom. It dulls our wisdom. Verse 10, whatever my eyes desired, I did not keep from them. I did not withhold my heart from any pleasure. For my heart rejoiced in all my labor, and this was my reward from all my labor. Then I looked on all the works that my hands had done and on the labor which I had told, and indeed all was vanity and grasping of wind, for there was no profit under the sun. And again, you just have to understand where much is given, folks, much is required. All right? Uh, we just, you know, what God gives us, we need to use for His glory. There's so many people out there that don't have what we have, and uh, we need to uh, be that good neighbor. We need to be that person that has mercy on others, and we really need, and, and that's really why God blesses us, he blesses us so that we can be a blessing to others. That's why he does. Folks, the bottom line in our, our uh, lesson tonight is only Jesus can satisfy your soul. I know it says, in my heart, all right, he, he was pondering these things, and I'm not questioning that, but somehow 
Not that he lost his salvation, but I believe as he got on later in life, he went into a backslidden condition where the things that he used to believe, he just didn't believe anymore. And, and here's what I, I've heard this in several cases in the last year. People that have grown up in the church, people that have grown up in the church as they hit their 30s and, and their early, you know, early 35s and, and things like that, they are just walking away from church. I've even had a couple of people tell me that their grandkids are agnostic or even one of them claims to be an atheist now. Okay? And, and again, folks, you know, they, they, they lose that, that, that grounding, that word of God. The, they, they listen to people and, you know, uh, you, can, you can get online. Folks, you can listen to anything online. And we need to be careful what our kids and our grandkids are listening to. It's so, so important. And only Jesus can satisfy our soul. And the other thing that I've learned in the lesson today with um, Solomon is, no matter how successful we are, we need to stay humble. We need to be humble. Folks, again, I believe God blesses his people. All right? But it doesn't say we are exempt from trouble doesn't say we're not going to have heartache. It doesn't say we're not going to have struggles. And we need to just stay true to God in everything that we do. And there is, there, there is uh, trouble sometimes in success. It goes to their head. Their britches get big. Let me give me a grandpa. Your britches is getting too big is what my grandpa used to tell me. All right? Even in athletics, you know, uh, you know, you can get it successful. You look at the millionaires. Nobody's worth $30 million a year to pay football. Nobody, folks. And it gets to their head. 2 Timothy 3. 2 Timothy 3. 2 Timothy 3. Boy, if this does not describe America today. Look at this. 2 Timothy 3. one. But know this. In the last days, perilous times will come. Folks, they're here. The perilous times are here. For men will be lovers of themselves. There you go. Lovers of money, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, unloving, unforgiving. Does this not sound like the headlines in our newspapers? It does. Slanders without self control. If it feels good, do it. All right, man, I would not follow that advice. Brutal, despisers of good, traitors, headstrong, headstrong. Uh, you're wrong and I'm right. All right, and we're always wrong. The Christian side is wrong, okay? Haughty, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, having a form of godliness but denying his power. And yeah, I'll go to church. I'll go to church for an hour a week. All right, and then the rest of the week, all right, they are not living biblical Christianity. And from such people turn away, for this is the sword of who creep into the houses and make captives of gullible women loaded down with sins, led away with various lust, always learning, never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. And folks, I'm telling you, misinformation is all over the internet. It's everywhere. And I will say this, and I know many of you are on, I'm not slamming you for being on Facebook. That is a personal opinion. But when I got off Facebook, it was one of the best things I did because that Facebook time, I'm just telling you, it, it turned into to, to quiet time for me. And, and you can get on there. I, I, I'm not lambasting you for that. But you cannot believe everything you see. Anybody can write anything they want. And folks, it's a trap. So many times it's a trap. And, and we need to uh, not get caught up in the world's ways. 1 Corinthians 10.31. Throw that one up here, if you would, Tony. I, here's my last verse. Therefore, whether you eat or you drink, whatever you do, do all. To the glory of God. Amen. Everything we do. 
And folks, I don't worry about what people think of me. I really don't. All right, I am who I am in Jesus Christ. I'm going to preach the Word of God. I'm going to look at the Word of God, and I know it is not popular with the world today. And I'm not looking to make a name. I'm not trying to get people out in front of our church to protest. That's not what I'm trying to do. I'm trying to be faithful as a servant of God and a preacher of the gospel. And we've lost some of these, you know, some people even call it old-fashioned. All right, some people say, yeah, you need to get up, you know, in the 21st century. Folks, I'm just telling you, my job and our job is to follow the Word of God. Just follow God. Don't chase the wind. Don't chase the world. All right? Chase after God and chase after righteousness. And the Bible says all these things will be added unto you. Folks, I, I have, you know, I, I, I have chased the wind for a while. And folks, there, there was nothing satisfying out there. There was nothing. When I got saved when I was 22 years old, I'm telling you, my life turned around, and it's been a joy. I, I mean this with all my heart. If I were to die today, I would die with a smile on my face, thanking God that I got to serve the Lord as long as I've got to serve the Lord. All right, 20, I mean 40 years. Steve, same thing, 40 years we've been in the ministry, and we are blessed. And Folks, I wouldn't trade it. You say, oh, no, no, let me give you a billion dollars and a yacht and an island. Folks, I'm just telling you, you talk about boring. Setting on an island. Boring. Father, thank you for the day. And God, I thank you that life is full. God, our life is abundant. And God, I pray we would not let the world influence us. And God, I just pray, Lord, that you would just help us to stay true to the word. Lord, it really doesn't matter what the rich and famous do. I don't read Star Magazine. There's nothing in it for me. And God, I just pray that we would take our eyes off of the world and keep our eyes on Jesus Christ. God, the most important relationship we have is with God and Jesus. And Lord, everything else will fall into place. That's what it says. But seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. All these things will be added to you. God, I thank you that we get to live a great life while we're here on earth. And God, I'm just telling you, the best is yet to come. You talk about having everything. You talk about a perfect place, a perfect environment. You talk about no temptation, none, zilch, zero. No hospitals, our glorified bodies, the marriage lamb, the feast, God. It is going to be awesome. And God, I thank you that we get to live with you forever and ever and ever. So God, if uh, we get a chance to testify, Lord, we've all chased the wind or chased the world at one time in our lives. And I think now we say, thank you, but no thanks. And I thank you that you fill our lives with love and with joy and with peace. And God, thank you. Thank you for your son, Jesus Christ. Thank you, Lord, that we can learn. We can learn on how not to do it so that we will do it the right way. God, we love you. We praise you for this night. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Thank you so much for coming tonight.